So my name is Michelle Schaefer. I'm a PhD student in Dr. Christy Lewis's lab at UCF. And today I'd like to tell you about my fellowship research on trends of seagrass, forage fish, and predators uh, within the Indian River Lagoon. So just some background. The Indian River Lagoon is a large estuarine ecosystem located along the east coast of Florida. It is known as one of the most biologically diverse estuaries in North America. This is partially driven by a geographic transition zone marked at the 28 degrees north latitude line here. This means that you have uh, both subtropical and tropical species existing within one area driving up the biological diversity. And for example, we have approximately 2,100 different species of plants and 685 different species of fish. So many of these fish can utilize Indian River Lagoon habitat, such as seagrass meadows, for foraging on smaller inverts or forage fish, for juvenile shelter, and for spawning aggregations. My research focuses on the links between seagrass forage fish and larger uh, recreationally important predators. Um, these links have been displayed in previous re research on smaller spatial scales, but there's still, it still remains quite elusive for a, a for a broader scale, which is what my research is trying to get at. So other than its ecological importance, the lagoon is also economically important. Uh, tourism is a major part of their economy, and this is made of boating, water sports, but mostly recreational fishing. And as you can see here in the image on the right, this angler has just caught a very large red drum and is extremely happy to have done so. Um, he has also likely spent a lot of time, effort, and money in sustaining his uh, angler hobbies, as you can see with all of his um, gear on his kayak. Ultimately, this helps contribute towards the $7.6 billion total annual economic value of the lagoon system. Thus, a large portion of the lagoon economy is hinged directly on lagoon health. Unfortunately, just like many other estuaries within North America, the Indian River Lagoon faces natural and anthropogenic induced changes, one of the most notable being the super bloom of 2011 through 2012. Um, while the direct causes of this bloom are still highly debated, the literature mainly points to non-point source uh, nitrogen enrichment, so leaky septic tanks, as well as absence of uh, grazing pressure from zooplankton on these novel algal species and hypersaline conditions. This superbloom resulted in major seagrass die-off due to high turbidity within the system. If you look at the graph at the bottom from Morris et al, this shows acres of seagrass from 1943 through 2017. And the red box is the super bloom event. You can see a drastic decline in acres of seagrass during that event and after. Unfortunately, these blooms have now become commonplace within the Indian River Lagoon system, further perpetuating the cycle of seagrass loss and preventing seagrass recovery. So I'm asking how has seagrass loss impacted recreationally important predator and forage fish abundance in the Indian River Lagoon, Florida? To answer this question, I have three main objectives. The first is to conduct a diet composition study to better understand predator-prey interactions in the Indian River Lagoon. As we've already talked um, extensively about, there are not a whole lot of diet studies currently within the IRL. So, um, our predator-prey interactions are mainly informed from other estuarine ecosystems. My second objective is to evaluate long-term trends of these recreationally important predators and their forage fish prey abundance within the lagoon. And then the third is to use spatial temporal analyses um, in an attempt to disentangle the influence of seagrass presence on these recreationally important predators and their forage fish from many of the other drivers of abundance within the IRL. So just a quick note on my target recreationally important predators. Um, my, these species are the red drum, common snook, and spotted sea trout. 
I selected these species because of their recreational importance, but also because of extensive, extensive li literature indicating a relationship with seagrass habitat, either through spawning aggregation as juvenile shelter or as forage for forage fish, prey, and invertebrates. So moving into the methods and results for my first objective, um, conducting a diet composition study to better understand predator-prey interactions in the lagoon. So <clears throat> I collected predator stomachs during monthly state fisheries independent monitoring, or FIM, with the help of FWC employees at the Melbourne lab. Um, on the right is a picture of this data collection, so you can get an idea of um, the how they deploy the seines used to collect data. Uh, these stomachs were then brought back to UCF and stomach content was processed using Florida Wildlife Research Institute methodology. Um, just as a side note, I did go out um, to the St. Pete area and did some training with the experts out there, the gut lab experts, Jules and Mallory and Kevin, um, so they could get me up to par on these on this methodology and then I came back to UCF and trained uh, helped train an undergrad in this methodology as well so I had some an extra hand with um, all of these gut samples coming in but in a nutshell this means um, this methodology is morphological identification and volumetric measurements and um, lowest possible taxonomic identification uh, for the morphological identification due to digestion um, can definitely interfere with how low of a level you can identify a prey item to. Um, on the right is a picture that gives you an idea of what these stomachs look like, in this case a uh, snook stomach, and then along the bottom are some of the forage fish and invertebrates that I've found within these stomachs. So ultimately, I will establish a baseline data set for trophic interactions and conduct multivariate analyses with this diet data. So just as a disclaimer, um, COVID-19 has definitely affected the progress of my research with this, um, as I'm sure it's affected many of your research projects. So stomach Processing has been delayed for February and March, and currently we don't have any stomachs collected for April, but um, it is my goal to continue processing once restrictions are lifted with uh, the long-term goal of establishing a gut lab in collaboration with FWC uh, for the Indian River Lagoon system. So moving into the results of my first objective, um, Beginning September 2019 through January 2020, we collected 96 stomachs in total. 51 of those were common snook, 20 of those were red drum, and 25 of those were spotted sea trout. Of those stomachs collected, 35% of snook and red drum and 48% of spotted sea trouts were stomachs were empty. These graphs show prey frequency within predator stomachs for each of the predators. Along the x-axis is prey taxon, while along the y-axis is prey frequency. And I've marked um, the prey that tend to be associated with seagrass with seagrass blades on the graph. Overall, the most abundant, the most common prey taxon, of course, was Actinopterygii, Pinaid shrimp, anchovies, and mahara. And then species that we saw within the stomachs that tend to be associated with seagrass include pinfish, mahara, Pinaid shrimp, blue crabs, polychaetes, and bivalves. So <clears throat> we also did a multivariate analysis to look at diet overlap. Um, and these graphs are non-parametric MDS, MDS plots using bray curtis similarities. Um, so each point represents a stomach sample when which there was prey content present. The closer samples are to each other, the more similar they are, and then the further they are from each other, the less similar they are. Um, so on the top left is the MDS showing um, diet of all three predators with Actinopteria GI included. Uh, you'll notice that there's not, um, there's that none of the diets tend to stand out from each other, and there's not a significant difference in diets between predators. The graph on the right 
is when actinopterygii has been removed. Um, and again, there's still no significant difference in diets between the three predators, but we do see, start to see this separation of diet between red drum and then snook and uh, spotted sea trout. So again, this is only five months of uh, gut content data. So it's definitely um, preliminary, but even more reason to keep collecting this data and see if this kind of separation of red drum out from spotted sea trout and common snook um, continues with more data. Um, <clears throat> so moving on to my second objective, evaluating long-term trends of predator and forage fish prey abundance within the Indian River Lagoon. So just a quick note on the fisheries independent monitoring. We've already talked pretty extensively about the structure of this. But this is within the Indian River Lagoon system. This is over two decades of data on um, commercially important invertebrate and fish abundance and distribution, as well as environmental parameters such as seagrass and dissolved oxygen. On the right are graphs of the Northern Indian River Lagoon and Southern In Indian River Lagoon universe and their sampling scheme. <clears throat> For my study, I am covering the full extent of the Indian River Lagoon. Thus, my study years are from 1998 through 2018, um, as the southern part of the lagoon didn't start sampling until 1997. And the data included in my study is from 21.3 meter seines and 183 meter seines. And just to get an idea of what the size of these predators are for include within my study, here are some histograms of each of the predators. So there's definitely a high rate of smaller in individuals, likely from that smaller saying, as well as some larger individuals as well. So <clears throat> the first step that was summarizing all of this data, um, all the abiotic seagrass and abundance data. So fish and invertebrate abundance was summarized as catch per unit effort. My abiotic variables were summarized as a mean per, op per observation event. And seagrass was summarized as a presence absence binary variable. So <clears throat> the first step here really is to take a, a broad look at the trends that we see in abundance over time within the Indian River Lagoon. And, to, and so to get an idea of how that may differ between pre-seagrass die-off and post-seagrass die-off, I split the data set into two time periods from 1998 through 2009 and from 2010 to 2018. And again, uh, this choice was made based on that super bloom event, which kind of kick-started the decline in seagrass within the Indian River Lagoon. So I want to evaluate the influence of abiotic and biotic variables um, on abundance on a broader scale. So moving into my results, uh, the next three slides will be um, showing trends over time just in abundance. So on the left is always going to be the predator and on the right is always going to be the prey. Um, <clears throat> So I also have in each of these graphs a blue line that is just a simple linear regression of the CPU over time, CPU E over time. And I also have an orange line on each graph marking that split in the uh, time periods, which were then compared using the Wilcox and Rank sum test, which is very similar to a t-test, only non-parametric, and it uses the median values instead of the mean. So overall, we saw an increase in snook catch per unit effort over the time period, the entire time period, and did find a significant in increase between the two time periods. When looking at the prey, and these prey were selected based on the diet study, uh, ones most commonly found within their diet. So for snook, that was anchovies, pinnated shrimp, and mullet. Um, so there was a mix of responses for these different forage fish prey items. Anchovies had a significant steadily decline over the entire time period um, significantly, as well as the uh, pinnated shrimp. And mullet actually had a significant in increase in catch per unit effort over the time period. 
so moving on to the spotted sea trout. <laughs> Uh, generally speaking, we saw a slight decline in the linear, uh, simple linear regression on the graph, but nothing significant. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of variations in these peaks and troughs with the catch per unit effort. Looking at their most common prey items, anchovy, mahara, and pinfish. Again, we saw kind of a mixed uh, scenario of some of the prey items increasing and some decreasing. So again, the anchovies were decreasing over the time period as, um, and the mahara were increasing. And then the pinfish were slightly decreasing. I guess that got cut off there. Um, but the mahara and the pinfish did not show a significant difference in between the two time periods where the anchovies did. So lastly, the red drum. Um, again, uh, no significant difference between the two time periods, but there is a, a slight decline overall. And then considering their two most common prey items, um, commercial crab and uh, panea shrimp, there is actually a significant increase in crab over the time period and a significant decrease in shrimp over the time period. Again, prey with, of this predator, the forage fish prey of this predator are moving, are increasing and decreasing. So as I'm sure as you're looking at all these graphs, you'll notice that there is a lot of variation over time in the catch per unit effort. Um, and this is likely influenced by multiple drivers within the system, not just seagrass. Um, and anyone that works in, within an estuary knows how difficult it can be to disentangle some of these variables. For example, 2010, we had a major freeze event within the lagoon system, followed by the super bloom event, which I've already talked about, where we had drastic declines in seagrass uh, bed extent, and then further followed by two more harmful alpha blooms within the Indian River lagoon system. So basically, it's one thing that I struggled with with this study is it's really difficult to tease apart the effects of seagrass loss on forage fish and their recreationally important predators amongst all these different variables and events going on within the system. So to try to um, isolate some of the more important variables influencing catch per unit effort of these predators, I did stepwise regression. Um, so these stepwise regressions basically just take into account forwards and backwards fitting of regressions with the goal of finding the most parsimonious model. And this is identified through the lowest AIC value. So I had three models. Um, each of them, the response variable was predator catch per unit effort and then uh, forage fish and invertebrate prey catch per unit effort, seagrass presence, secchi depth, mean water depth, mean temperature, salinity, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, and pH were all presented um, in the stepwise regression as potential explanatory variables. Additionally, I log transformed the predator and prey catch per unit effort due to a substantial positive skew within the data, which you can see in the histograms here, the histogram here at the bottom of the untransformed and transformed data. While it still does not display a normal distribution, um, it is a, a slightly better for the regression. However, it's still not perfect and non-parametric measures are ultimately the goal here. Um, I also squared abiotic variables and I did this after evaluating um, abiotic variables against catch per unit effort and saw this quadratic curve in their relationship. And this makes sense if you think about it as there's an optimal temperature for survival of snook um, framed by two, you know, in unsurvivable conditions. So it makes sense that you might see these patterns in ecology. So these, this is the results from my predatory, predator, predator <laughs> stepwise regressions. Um, and much to my dismay, it really did not help narrow down any of the variables that I was considering. 
that'll take you through it by each panel. The panel on the left is my spotted sea trout. Some interesting things to note about this model is that they did have a positive correlation with seagrass and interestingly enough, a negative correlation with pinfish catch per unit effort. Now moving to this uh, common snook, they actually had a negative, a slight negative correlation with seagrass and a negative correlation with catfish catch per unit effort as well, which was one prey item we did find within their stomachs and also a potential competitor is catfish abundances have been increasing within the Indian River Lagoon system. And then looking at the red drum model, um, again, we saw this negative, slight negative correlation with seagrass and a negative correlation with secchi depth, indicating that their catch per unit effort actually increase with turbidity. And then looking at the, I have the R square, adjusted R square values at the bottom. Um, you'll notice that these are not extremely high, but um, it's kind of the case with working in ecology that um, it, it's unrealistic to expect a value really close to one. So these R square values might be more important when comparing models to each other. And again, this is, kind of my, my first iteration of these models. Um, there are just too many variables present in each model for me to be happy with this. And um, so I'm currently looking at some other approaches to evaluate this. Um, and I actually think the EDM approach might be really good for this scenario. So moving on to my third objective, using spatial temporal analyses an attempt to disentangle the influence of seagrass presence on recreationally important predators and their forage fish. So my first objective was to develop a hotspot hot spot maps from the geo-referenced abundance data for each species. Um, and again, I split this into two time periods, pre-seagrass and post-seagrass die-off. Now, if you're not familiar with optimized hotspot analysis, um, it takes abundance point data and identifies areas of significantly higher abundance and significantly lower abundance with the higher being in red and the blue being uh, the lower being in blue. So in terms of ecology this higher abundance may indicate what clustering behavior of a species while lower abundance um, areas indicate avoidance behavior of a species. Now, originally, my next step was to conduct geographically weighted regressions within uh, ArcGIS, but I ran into a roadblock with this. Um, the, this analysis does not work well with um, non-normal data, and it also does not work well with nominal or binary data, as in the case of my seagrass variable. So I kind of had to, sorry. I had to go back to the drawing board on this one as this wasn't going to be a very suitable fit. And I've decided to try to evaluate spatial correlations of fish catch per unit effort and seagrass presence using a time slider. So you can see over time how abundance and distribution is changing, not just temporally, but also spatially. And looking at spatial correlations between raster layers. Um, and this is done with the SDM select package in R. And basically it takes two rasters and compares them for correlations and green areas would indicate areas of higher correlation and red areas would indicate areas of lower correlation between the two raster data sets. And this part is still under construction. Um, I'm still working through the best way to do this, again with a seagrass being a binary uh, variable. So moving into the results of my geospatial analyses are the hotspot maps. Um, so the next three slides will all be hotspot maps and there'll be a predator on the left and prey item on the right or forage fish on the right. Uh, so <clears throat> in each of these maps you have a left and a right panel. The left panel is from the first time period, the pre-seagrass die-off time period. And the right panel is from the second time period, post seagrass die-off time period. 
And just as a reminder, red regions represent clustering behavior and species, while blue regions represent avoidance behavior and species. So starting with the common snook, between the two time periods, we saw that hot spots disappeared near Turkey Creek while cold spots increased near the mouth of St. Lucie River at the bottom of the map. And then looking over at the Panayad shrimp, we saw a decrease in hot spots near Turkey Creek and the disappearance of hot spots near Vero Beach. So this can kind of help us spatially locate areas of concern that we may want to look at. In this case, with um, commercial shrimp being a major prey item we found within the diets, you would expect to see a decline in common snook potentially as well, but this trend is not necessarily apparent here, so there's likely something else going on. So then moving on to spotted sea trout, again the same layout, red representing uh, regions of clustering behavior and blue representing regions of avoidance behavior. So spotted sea trout, um, between the two time periods we saw the disappearance of hot spots within the Banana River region and an increase near the Melbourne area. And then if you look at Mahara, one of the um, main prey items found within the spotted sea trout stomachs, you'll see that there was an increase in hot spots near the Melbourne area. So again, this increase in potential prey within that area may have attracted sea trout, um, and so it's worth looking into that region to uh, tease more apart what variables are at play there. And then finally, the hot spot of red drum and commercial shrimp. So the red drum um, saw a decrease in, um, in hot spots near the Turkey Creek area, <clears throat> while the cold spots entirely disappeared from the Banana River. The commercial shrimp, again on the right, we saw a decrease in the Turkey Creek area and the disappearance of hot spots near Vero Beach. So remembering that we saw a decline in the red drum abundance before when looking at the time series graphs, it may be um, correlated with this decrease in prey availability of shrimp as this was one of the main prey items within their stomach that they were eating from the diet composition study. So moving on to the spatial interpolation time sliders, this is a cool tool that can help us visualize abundance um, over time as well as uh, spatially. So you can see, are they moving to different regions um, for whatever reason, or are they staying put? So these graphs will show a spotted sea trout catch per unit effort points overlapping spatial interpolation of seagrass presence. And this interpolation map was developed from that binary seagrass data. Um, so to or orient you to that, the purple regions are low probability of seagrass, while the green regions are higher probability of seagrass. And again, we have our split time periods. Um, you'll notice this time that the time periods have been shortened. And I did this to try to help reduce the noise within the data um, and isolate any sort of um, redistribution that may have occurred due to seagrass loss. So you can watch each of the time sliders. And the red points are the catch per unit effort points. And when they're in lighter color means lower catch per unit effort, darker color means higher catch per unit effort. And you'll notice that there really was no big change in catch per unit effort, depending on if seagrass was present or not. Overall, there might be a, slight, a slightly higher proportion of the higher catch per unit efforts in the first time period than the second, but nothing substantial. Okay, so moving into my discussion um, and just kind of summarizing what I've found so far from my research. Uh, preliminary data results from the diet study do suggest the separation of red drum diet, which is to be expected based on um, diet's information from other systems. Uh, we also saw that these all three predators are eating forage fish and invertebrates that are seagrass and non-seagrass associated. We also saw that um, they are 
consuming prey that are e increasing during the time period as well as other prey that are decreasing during the time period. So this could um, suggest that there might be dietary shifts going on if they were reliant upon, upon one prey species that has now decreased drastically like the shrimp or if um, in the case of catfish that increased um, uh, significantly over the time period, maybe there's an increased competition between the three recreationally important predators and now catfish also eating the same prey base as well. And then looking at um, the models and trying to disentangle variables, um, as I've already mentioned, this is challenging as always to try to disentangle the variables within a system, especially an estuarine ecosystem and trying to build a model that works with non-normal data, data and zero inflated data. So <clears throat> my next step is potentially exploring other seagrass data that are continuous and not, nine bi not binary. Um, so that could give me a little more information on seagrass trends um, and also evaluating the use of more complex non-parametric models. Um, I think EDM, again, could be a, a good application here. Um, as well as I've been looking at building this um, in a Bayesian model as well. And so through our geospatial analyses thus far, the hotspot spot, hot maps reveal similar shifts in abundance between some predator and forage fish prey, but not necessarily all of them. Um, and the time slider can be a useful tool to show these changes in distribution and abundance over time, especially um, later, um, it could be a useful tool within my interactive web tool for management. And overall, the GIS regressions are not currently suitable for handling nominal and non-normal data. So um, just utilizing correlation maps in R where I, there's more freedom to work with these different types of data. So I want to show you this real quick. This is um, the abundance and seagrass correlation maps within R. Um, on the left is sea trout and seagrass correlation from 2007 to 2009, and on the right is sea trout and seagrass correlation from 2010 to 2012 again, divided by that pre-seagrass and post-seagrass die-off. So red regions show a low, low correlation between abundance and seagrass presence, while green regions show a high correlation between abundance and seagrass presence. So you'll notice something very strange about these maps, and that's that they're kind of showing a very different tr trend that you would expect, and that there was less seagrass in 2007 to 2009 and more, or sorry, there was more seagrass 2007, 2009 and less 2010 through 2012. However, it's showing a stronger correlation within the latter time period of known less seagrass. So I think that this may again be a problem with the binary data within the correlation equation. So moving forward, um, I'll try to approach this differently. Um, and take the correlations between species abundance catch per unit effort and then visually compare that to a seagrass raster and um, try to draw some conclusions from that um, until I can figure out a way to work around the binary seagrass data. So future directions and some of my goals for summer 2020. Um, I need to further develop these regressions and raster correlations. Um, something that is non-parametric and can, is suitable for um, non-normal data and quadratic relationships. Um, I'll also be publishing my findings, uh, hopefully by August 2020, as well as finishing up with an interactive web tool that I've been building of research findings from this research to be used in IRL fisheries management. And the goal of this is to help adapt complex uh, temporal, spatial temporal trends to a language that's transferable to stakeholders as well as communicating the importance of uh, central fish habitat and other environmental parameters within the Indian River Lagoon. So I'd just like to thank everyone that has helped me along the way so far. Um, 
Jason, Justin, Tim, and Kevin for providing a lot of really awesome uh, feedback and just, you know, bouncing some interesting ideas of trends within the IRL off of each other, as well as Rich Caperno and the FWC field staff for helping me collect uh, predator stomachs within the Indian River Lagoon. I literally could not do the, that portion of my study without their help, and I really, really appreciate it. I um, also want to thank Jules and Mallory from the gut lab as well for taking the time to train me and um, diet composition analyses, as well as my advisor and my undergraduate researcher, Neha, to, for helping me uh, process all the stomachs that we have coming in. So with that, I'll take any questions. That was a really great job. Um, Really, really interesting stuff. Like those results are super cool. Um, does Thank anyone you. have any questions they'd like to ask right now? I don't see anybody raising their hand or feel free to just jump in. I, I, I've got a question. Michelle, did I, did I see that wrong? But it looked like um, pinfish CPUE actually went up after 2010 when you saw a concomitant decline in seagrass abundance. Um. So I'm pretty sure that it went down. Um, actually, it, it, it well, I mean, these graphs don't tell us a whole lot about those fluctuations within those, those time periods, but it remained pretty stable. But if we use a better approach than simple linear regression, I could see where there's um, a sharp decline. Um, but yeah. It's an interesting case with the pinfish because that's another prey item that it, while it did show up in the diets, it didn't show up as much as I anticipated it to. And so I know we've talked about um, pinfish kind of being an indicator of like the, a healthier ecosystem. So I don't know if that means, you know, further indication of the IR, IRL lagoon health kind of just plummeting, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Did you take a look at any of the other sort of related species? Like I know with, with some of these, it's a little tricky because, you know, with the confident intervals and what's actually going on, it's tough to tease apart how much of a change we're really seeing over time. But I know for us in some of our catches that we're getting of a mosquito, for example, you know, you see switches between pinfish and pigfish and there's certain species in the system that kind of have very similar roles. And I'm wondering if you've sort of, you know, when you're seeing something like a potential decline in pig, pinfish, is there some other species that is increasing? Have you started to dig into the, the forage fish in that regard? Um, so one thing I did notice is that Mahara have actually slightly increased over that time period. And I don't know, um, I guess they're not really occupying the same trophic niche, um, but it's definitely worth digging further into that. One thing that did stand out to me was an increase in catfish, a drastic increase in catfish over the time period. Um, so I think that's also worth looking into more is if increased competition within the system. Um, I don't think I have the graph here, but yeah, that's something to dig into, Dr. Cook. That's also, in terms of the catfish, that's something we've had um, recreational fishers asking us up in Mosquito, we've been seeing, they've been noticing a lot more catfish. So that is mm -hmm. something that may be playing out in some of these parts of the system. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a follow-up question that I had, I noticed with your three, three sport fish that you're looking at, did you break it down by ontogeny in terms of different size classes and seeing what you're seeing in the prey base, or did you sort of group them all together? So right now they're grouped all together, but I think that's an important next step in the data is to separate out um, size classes and also to look at if um, like this peak in spotted sea trout, was that actually driven by a really good year for young of the year and just kind of getting at some of those other drivers because right now it's a very like 30,000 foot look at everything going on but uh, yeah I, I do want to separate all that out. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey Michelle, Michelle. and Kevin. Um, Hi. I had a couple <laughs> questions or uh, comments mm -hmm. uh, regarding your analysis. Um, I think it's some really good results. I think the first on your diet, you'll start seeing more separation of the diets as you get more sample sizes, basically. Mm -hmm. So as you can start looking at guts again, mm -hmm. that'll help 
uh, clarify some of the sea trout, snook, redfish diet overlap stuff. Mm -hmm. um, when you're modeling CPUE over time, you're trying to do it on like a, a linear normal regression on log stuff to like reduce the the high catches and stuff. Uh, just um, I don't know that it'll really change your results, but in what we do, we just don't even worry about normalizing data and just model it with a negative binomial. Okay. You don't usually need to zero inflate it. Uh, the dispersion is usually not that bad, but mm -hmm. but in house we just run GLMs just with a negative binomial uh, distribution. We don't mess with all that. But I guess were you doing that to keep it on the same uh, kind of like the same method going forward to the spatial stuff because that was going to be normal data yeah. modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was part of the reason, and just have, being able to because I had both sayings, um, being able to say catch per unit effort instead of just general abundance was one of the other um, important decisions. Okay. Yeah, okay, that makes sense because mm -hmm. yeah, you'll need the discrete values. Okay, uh, that makes sense. The um, yes, yeah, so that could make you know the GLM approach more straightforward um, mm -hmm. if you're if you're getting stuck on that some of that stuff. Yeah. The model selection, um, you take like a model averaging approach to determine the importance of some of those variables. Because I know that doing forward and backward selection is sometimes affected by your starting point. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is also in that you have Secchi depth. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't include that or draw any conclusions from that. I, it's it's okay. really tempting, especially given the questions, because. Sure. Water, quali water quality or water clarity is obviously really interesting, but the problem in most of these samples is that the Secchi is on the bottom. It's just clear until you hit the ground, and so it's not really particularly indicative of water quality. I mean, it is in some places, and that's the whole goal, but the sites are often too shallow for it to be meaningful. Okay. I guess. So I'd, I would caution against using any conclusions from that. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, a really good start analytically. And yeah, the, the problem is you have time series of all these species that are changing due to any variety of factors or just because of randomness. And you're trying to detangle dietary, competitive, and habitat effects all at once. So That's a lot. Yeah, so moving forward, yeah, getting more fine scale on some of that stuff and refining the size classes and the gears you're using uh, could help with that. And we can have those discussions you know, later. But. Okay, thank you. Just some thoughts. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, I was wondering, um, is there anything else in the data that's collected that could get us at turbidity? Because, I mean, that's no, just I mean, so that's important. Is, yeah, yeah, Secchi is, Secchi is your data for that. What I would maybe do is exclude it you have to maybe just only look at Secchi depth on sites where the depth is, the actual depth of the net or where it was recorded was actually deeper than the Secchi. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because you just have so many that it's just on the bottom, so it's not really, it's not really yeah. telling you I mean, what the Secchi would be if it was deeper, you know? Yeah. Yeah, one of, um, one of Michelle's hypotheses, you know, is thinking about Turbidity can be used from as a protection from predation, similar to sea grass. Maybe there is like some kind of, especially for the, some of these visual predators. So you know, it could be help helping and harming, and for certain species, depending on the turbidity and lack of sea grass, etc. So. Yeah, I mean that's a really interesting hypothesis. Um, you ha you would have to look at that question separate from the larger data set and subset it mm -hmm. to only sites where you have secchi depths that are greater than the depth of the site. So you actually have a measure of, you know, water turbidity that way. Um, and then you don't want to disclude yeah. all those other sites though from your overall analysis. So yeah, you'd have to like pull out a subset of your net sets and then look at that specific question separately. I think from the general just yeah. throwing regression. So. Yeah, and that's something a, you want to change. This you is can, a good, uh, think about it. Yeah, it's a good example of why for the students that are listening is why you want to work closely with the state and the folks that are collecting the data because they know these 
intricacies a little bit better, a lot better than us. And that's why we um, really, it's just a really important part of when you're collaborating with state entities and federal entities using your data. And uh, Michelle went out in the field to, uh, and, and sampled with the, the crew. And so it's just a really important part of it. So I just definitely wanted to say that. But yeah, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that insight. Yeah, and I'm, only, I'm just trying to do my best Tim impression here with like thinking about the catch data. So uh, any more specific stuff you can get into it offline or and I can forward on questions and stuff to him too. So. Okay. Yep, thanks.